Anyway, if you have your Bibles with you tonight, go ahead and be turning to the book of Proverbs chapter number four. <clears throat> Again, the book of Proverbs chapter number four. And I will try to be mindful of the time tonight. Uh, you know the, uh, what they say, when, uh, what it means when a preacher looks at his watch? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So I, but I will try to be mindful of uh, the time tonight. I do not have the strongest voice, so that may lend to uh, me being more mindful of the, of the time. Just if my voice starts going, I don't want, to, want y'all to suffer too much, more than you already do when you hear me speak anyway. But we'll be reading uh, in the book of Proverbs chapter 4, verses 23 through the end of the chapter. And it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thy eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. And Lord, we are thankful uh, for your word and the uh, message that it, that it has in it. Lord, I thank you for the availability that we have of the word today. I thank you for the work of the Gideons and the work of all those who've put in work to distribute the word of God. And Lord, I, I do ask that you help us as a nation to continue to spread your word and to uh, reach others, Lord, uh, with your gospel. Lord, I ask that you open the doors for us. But tonight, I do ask that you be with us in the next few moments. Help us to focus on you and your word tonight and the message that you have for us tonight, Lord, that we'll be able to learn more about you and be able to grow closer to you. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. And amen. amen. Now the heart is a very tricky subject. We live in a day and age where I remember, um, I'll, I'll be honest, I grew up when uh, the Disney Channel, Disney movies were uh, the normal. I remember we had, this is in the days of VHS tapes, we had, if you, uh, in one of the rooms in our house, if you were to open it up, it was completely full of movies. And a, a large portion of those movies were Disney movies. And the message of Disney for years and years have been, has been to follow your heart. And what a scary thing that is when you truly think about it. Yeah. And, we want, and we'll talk more about that uh, as we go through the message. But the world has told us for years just that. Follow your heart. Do what feels right. One of the things on... After a, tra after a tragedy that you may see on social media is things is people, not uh, hopefully not Christians, saying things like sending positive vibes your way. Because it's all about a feeling and, and we only do what feels right. I know before me is a large number of people who have been married for uh, decades and what a blessing that is. But, can I, but if I were to ask you if you always felt, felt like being married to your spouse and you were honest with me, you would probably tell me that there were times that, yeah, that you were done with them. Now, you may not admit that, but, uh, but, uh, but if, if we were only there for the good times, for the right feelings, then we would be in trouble. And, but tonight, I, I want to take a look at the heart and what the heart means and what the Bible is talking about here when it's talking about the heart. It's talking about the inner man, the mind, the will, who you are. It's your spiritual wants and desires. And you see, the, the problem with the heart is Jeremiah tells us in uh, Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 that the heart is deceitful above all things. So the problem is, whenever we follow our heart, it is something that will deceive you. Have you ever felt good about something to turn around and be burnt? I know I could tell you uh, stories about vehicles and things like that where I had a good feeling about it. I thought things were, well, uh, were going right just to turn around and, uh, you know, be selling it for pennies on the dollar. Uh, but, uh, but whenever things feel right does not always mean anything. Again, go, getting back to marriage, if we, were to only, uh, if we were to only love our spouse when we felt like it, it would cut back on love. But what will you find out as you've been married with time, and not that I'm an expert on the matter, is that love is a choice, not a feeling. I remember when I was in college, there was a man, I can't remember his name, but 
a missionary to the, uh, if to be politically incorrect, uh, to the gypsies uh, uh, that were that the, he he grew he and his wife grew up gypsies and gypsy families, and they had an arranged marriage and had never even spoken to each other before they got married. And this was uh, decades later, and they were still married, and it was the sweetest thing hearing him talk about his wife that he called his, uh, his sweetheart and his girlfriend. And, what, and he, he told us there in that chapel message that he reiterated to us that love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. So in our own lives, when we go by the feeling, we're already getting things wrong. And we already talked about what the Bible says, or what Jeremiah says about the heart, but what do other places say? We know that God wants someone who is after God's heart. The, someone who is pursuing after the heart of God. We won't turn there, but everyone knows that King David in Acts 13, 22 backs that up. That David was a man after the heart of God. So the heart is an important thing. And we know uh, from if you've been here on Wednesday nights, you've been going through it. You know we've got Saul, David, Solomon. Saul, no heart. David, whole heart. Solomon, half heart. And the problem with that, the problem with the no heart is, is you may look the part, you may act the part. Solomon, or King Saul was reigned for 40 years, but after his second year, he did not have a heart that followed after God. So the, the thing is, when we follow after our heart, it gets us into trouble. The end for Saul was terrible. He, he ended up dying in battle as well as his sons. And what a terrible thing that was because his heart was in the wrong place. Solomon... Uh, the one of the wisest, or no, not one of, the wisest man to ever live was warned by God beforehand, do not chase after the strange women uh, or you'll be serving their gods. And what did Solomon do? He started ch chasing after strange women, married them, and served their gods. So th thus he had a half heart. But he, he didn't have his heart where it should be. Another thing that we see about the heart that is important is that the heart is something that's required for salvation. Now, most of you can quote it, but the book of Romans chapter 10 and uh, verse number 9 tells us, as soon as I get there, that, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And verse number 10 to back it up, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And so the heart is something that is required for salvation. No one here, I, I know about everyone here. I think uh, most of you, if not all of you, claim to be saved and how great that is. But if your heart wasn't in it, then you did not get saved. If, you're, if your heart wasn't chasing after God, you did not get saved. However, if you believe with your heart, then heaven's your home. And, and you'll get to spend an eternity with Jesus. Moving on, uh, like I said, I want to be mindful of your time tonight. The man's, a man's heart is evil. We've already talked about Jeremiah, and, but if you want, talk, turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter number 7, and verses 21 through 23 tell us, uh, uh, from, uh, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, Thefts, thefts, covetousness, uh, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So the heart the, uh, is evil. You know, the most wicked thing that you could think of is in your heart. And it's the, our heart cannot be trusted. It's whatever we pay attention to. And tonight, that's what we're going to talk about is watching your heart because whatever you water in your heart is what's going to be made manifest to everyone else my pastor growing up a man by the name of Richard Haley I've heard him share the story many times when he was working at, uh, at General Electric he would that he would often be asked by some of the ladies oh Richard why don't you come to lunch with us and he would only go if there were multiple people there and it wasn't the same number. And people asked him, said, said how, did you, how did you go your life, all, uh, go all that time without the temptation? He said, I'll tell you, it wasn't without the temptation. But he said, I never trusted Richard Haley. That's a man who knew exactly what his heart was, what was in his heart. The moment where we, where we uh, become prideful and think, I've got this, my heart is where it's supposed to be, is the moment we better be ready for a fall. 
I remember a few years ago now, uh, our former vice president, Mike Pence, made the comment that he would not go out to dinner with a, with a lady unless his wife was present. And how he got ridiculed for that because how, uh, what is he, what is he thinking? How could, how could he believe that? He doesn't trust himself? The, the short answer is no, he doesn't trust himself. That's exactly why he didn't. You are a fool to trust yourself, to put yourself into sin and trust yourself. That makes, that would make you foolish. So we can't trust ourselves. We can't trust our own heart. So we know that the heart is w- wicked. What should we do with this? Well, we know. That salvation changes our heart. Look at me, if you will, at the, at the book of Psalm 51, verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> Psalm 51, 9 and 10 says, Hide thy face from my sin and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Amen. We know that God can give you a new heart. One of the things we talked about King Saul, King Saul, again, was a bad king for the, the, the vast, vast majority of his reign. But we find whenever he was on his way back after he had talked to Samuel, that God gave him a new heart. So that leads us to a next warning. God can give you a new heart, but you must protect it. That doesn't mean that you can lose your salvation. I want to back up and make that clear. Once you're saved, you are on your way to heaven, but you can still backslide. And, uh, and unfortunately, backsliding is easy because we live in a busy time. Our lives are busy. It's easy to go, 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 and then turn around and look and like, wait a second, where did I leave God back there? I know I've been guilty of that. If you've never had that problem, then that's great. But for me, I know that I'm saved. I know that, that Christ lives within my heart. But there has been times where there's a thought that goes through my mind or whatever. And you're like, where did that come from? And the problem is when you have those thoughts and you dwell on them, it leads to bad things. So with a new heart, we can fall away, but you won't lose your salvation. Remember, sin is a constant battle. There will never be a time where you wake up and you, you go out the door and you are perfect and commit zero sin that day. Wouldn't that be great? I believe it was John R. Rice who would carry a three by five card in his pocket. Every time he sinned, he would get it out and make a mark. And at the end of the day, he would take it and rip it up and ask God forgiveness for each one of those sins. I remember hearing that and thought, if I did that, I don't think I, I would fill up one three by five card. I think I would be going through packs every few days. So, uh, but uh, that's how vile we are. Sin is a constant battle. We, if we look at the people throughout the Bible, we've talked about Solomon already who followed after other gods. Demas who loved this present world, he fell away. Paul went fishing, walked away from Christ. And then later again, Paul started falling in with, or Peter rather, started falling in with the Judaizers and Paul had to correct him. After, after, the, great, after the flood, Noah and his family were the only ones who were saved. And what does Noah do? He gets drunk. And then we find Lot went to Sodom. I believe all men that that I just listed off are in heaven today, but they all struggled with sin. Some in different parts of their life, some in their life, some early in their life. But the one thing is they all had to go back. They all had issues with their heart, just as you and I may. And as we read in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, the first part of it says, keep thy heart with all diligence. So it tells us to keep it with all diligence, which means steady perseverance. It means don't let up. It, it means to, to stay on a constant lookout with the, uh, looking at yourself and, th- and saying, Lord, do I need my life cleaned up? Lord, am I letting sin in? Lord, help me get rid of it if I am. And we're, we're, to, we're, to, we're to keep that up in everything. Why? Because out of it are the issues of life. Our issues in this world come from our heart. Uh, because it's our heart that gets the desires. It's our heart that desires them, the money at all costs. It's our heart that loves this present world. It's our heart that whenever the Holy Spirit taps on our shoulder and tells us that we should witness to somebody that doesn't want to. Mm-hmm. I know I've been guilty of that more than once in my own life where there's someone that I know that the Holy Spirit is leading me to them and you're thinking, I don't want to talk to them. I heard a preacher speaking uh, or uh, give a share a story recently. He was going door to door 
with his church's visitation pro- program, and they go to a door. He knocks on the door, and there's a man who answers the door that, that says, wearing a shirt that says, Satan loves you. And in the background uh, there in the doorway, he can see all kinds of demonic things, you know, all kinds of the, uh, satanic symbols and things like that. So in his heart, he had already written this man off. And he was going through the motions, as I'm sure, as I know I have, and no doubt you probably have too, of, of going out because we're supposed to, and talking to people, but never really being into it. And he was ready to walk off when his visiting partner spoke up and began to talk to this man. And they were able to share the gospel with this man. And this man wearing a Satan loves you shirt asked, asked Christ to save him. Amen. You see, God often knows something that we don't know. Yeah. I have often thought, Pastor talked about the Ethiopian eunuch this morning, and I've often thought if Philip wouldn't have gone to the wilderness. I don't know what the impact of that was. We know that this Ethiopian eunuch was a man of great power. I don't know what the impact that he had when he got back to Ethiopia was, but I'm wondering how much that one event changed the world that would not have happened if Philip had, had his heart in the wrong place. If he hadn't been where he was supposed to be. If he had perhaps just been going through the motions. If when he, if, uh, if when he had asked this eunuch uh, what he was reading, he said, How could I know except some man guide me if this man would have, uh, if he would have said, Well, he doesn't know. It's not worth the time. I left a good thing back in Jerusalem. Let's go ahead and get back there. But no, he kept his heart in the right place. Now, the following verses after verse 23 tell us, how to keep our heart with all diligence. In verse 24, it says to put away from thee uh, a froward mouth and perverse lips far from thee. You know one thing that I find very strange among today's Christians, Christians, is how they'll be cussing you out, dropping F-bombs, and praising Jesus in the next breath. It makes absolutely no sense to me. I, I know there was, there's a particular couple that I'm thinking of and I mowed their yard, and uh, nice people, but they didn't act like Christians. And I remember we were talking one day, and I decided to start to witness to them, and I found out that they're very involved in their church, they're part of the worship team, and all those things, and I'm like, with that mouth, I would have never get, I didn't say that to them. But, uh, but, the, but we, we wonder why the world doesn't, isn't changing whenever the world doesn't see a change when they walk into church. And it all starts uh, with the way we talk. Because whether we like it or not, people judge you the moment you, they see you, the moment you open your mouth, whatever the case is. That, uh, and I know for years, uh, when I was in school, I always made good grades. And at the, at the end of the school testing, you know, you would get the results back and there was advanced, proficient, and um, unsatisfactory was the three designations. I remember I could go through uh, uh, through that list, and it would be advanced, 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 until you got to vocabulary. Then I was be, uh, uh, unsatisfactory, and then advanced, 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 advanced. I know I didn't, ha- I don't, still don't have a great vocabulary. So the problem with that is, without having a good vocabulary, I could open my mouth, and everyone here think I'm stupid. <laughs> but you probably wouldn't be far off. But but people judge you as soon as you open your mouth. I'm I've known people. I've shared this story before, but I remember this happening. <clears throat> Whenever I started Old Dominion, I started in Nashville. And there was this man there who was, uh, he was friendly, but just rough language all the time. And I remember I transferred my job back to Chicago to finish school up. Then I transferred back to Nashville. And uh, whenever I got back to Nashville, uh, this, this, this same man sent me a uh, Instagram follow, whatever it was, something on social media. And I remember reading his Twitter or his uh, profile there, and it says, I'm loud for Jesus. And I was like, hey, that's awesome. Because this is one of those guys that he didn't know how to whisper or talk normal. He was always, and if my voice wasn't messed up, it was like he was always yelling at you. No matter. So I'm like, well, he's definitely loud. I and mean, he's loud for Jesus. Hey, that's great. His life has changed. And I remember talking to him a few times at work, and his mouth hadn't changed. I don't know about his heart, but his mouth hadn't changed. And I remember this, this same driver, uh, as a, a couple months later, he was, uh, he got back to work. He'd asked to get off early one day and the bosses had told him, said, well, said, we'll see if you can get off early. We'll see what we have left when you get back. 
Is it okay? And he gets back and he's wanting to go home, but uh, the dispatcher looks at the work and he says, man, I need you. I need you to go do this. And this, this guy who's loud for Jesus begins to cuss everybody in that dispatch office. He walks out of the office, gets in his truck, and is driving like a maniac, running red lights, passing people on the shoulder. Somebody videos it, sends it back to uh, Old Dominion, and this man got fired. Rightfully so. I remember I was working, and I overheard the operations manager and the doc supervisor talking. And again, I was just in earshot and eavesdropping. But uh, they said, this guy claims to be a Christian, and that's exactly how he's talking. You see, our words do a lot of damage. Oh, yeah. The person who, who, said, who said sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, no. did not know what he was talking about. Right. Words can hurt so much worse than getting punched in the gut. Yeah, yeah. Words leave damaging scars. Our words, our lips, our mouth, they do things to people. We've got to watch it. Turn, or, uh, I'm going to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 12. <clears throat> And uh, verse 34 tells us, this is Jesus talking, and he's talking to the Pharisees and says, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So the problem with having a filthy mouth, the problem with having, uh, the, the, as the Bible uh, uh, puts it, a, uh, a froward mouth and perverse lips is it really shows what's going on here. It really shows the kind of person you are. It it shows uh, what our character is. Because if you can't tame your own tongue, what else is going on in your life? I remember talking to another driver, because, you know, truck drivers have nothing better to do than to talk on the phone to each other all day. And I remember a door open, and I began to witness to him. And he says, hey, he said, you know, I, I appreciate it. I got saved when I was a young adult and he um and he and he shared his testimony with me and it was an incredible testimony for time's sake i won't get into it but he was a he was raised catholic he's from the northeast raised catholic and he was actually at a reformed catholic bible study i never heard of such a thing when somebody shared the gospel with him and he got saved and how great that that is and he told me he said the one thing that i've not been able to give up is my language and I just, and I, and I can't help but stop and think, the God who can save your soul can't take the cuss words out of your mouth? Can't take the perversion out of your mouth? That's too much for him to do? I've heard my dad share the story many times. My dad didn't get saved until he was almost 21 years old. And there was a uh, preacher, I, can't, I want to say he was an evangelist maybe, uh, uh, that he'd gotten close to and they had, they invited him over to their house to play cards, and they were sitting there playing cards, and um, so something happened, and this preacher's wife let a four-letter word slip, and everybody just kind of like paused and shocked, and she said, oh, that's my little word. And I said, I'm sorry, I, you know, I, I'm a new Christian and all, but I didn't realize Christians were allowed to have their little words. And we're not. If it's not edifying, we should keep it out of our mouth. We shouldn't let it dwell in our minds. We should, we should try to cleanse that from us. Yeah. Romans uh, 12, 12, 2 tells us uh, to uh, be not conformed uh, to this world. We're not to try to take on those things. Yeah. I remember I was scrolling through social media the other day and uh, came across a post and uh, I had the volume on when I shouldn't have, and it says, when a Christian stubs his toe, and I'm like, oh, that's going to be funny, and I, and I watch it, and they said, it said a uh, four-letter word, and, said, and, and the whole meaning of the story was, Christians cuss too. That may be true, but I'm sorry, you should not be a safe person and cuss. Amen. That is ungodly. It is, not, it is a bad testimony for you. I have known people with mouths like that, just like the truck driver I was telling you about earlier, that... <clears throat> That when it, whenever they would come around, this pre, this Christian was oblivious to it, but and he would talk was talking just like the world. As soon as they walked away, they were doing nothing but making fun of them, mm-hmm. because a Christian should not have those words. Verse twenty five of Proverbs chapter number four tells us, "Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eye, eyelids look straight before the, uh, before thee." So. I'm sure 
Uh, most of you have been around horses or know enough about horses to know that especially in a race or anything, they put blinders on the horses. Why? So they don't get distracted. You know, the problem is there are, there are going to be things that are going to be put in front of us that, are, uh, that if we don't turn our eyes away from it, it's going to cause us to sin. I know in the case of David and Bathsheba, David wasn't where he was supposed to be, and there's something to be said for that. But as he looked, he saw Bathsheba, and if that had been it, there would have been no problem. But the problem was he looked again, and he began to lust because he didn't have his eyes where they were supposed to be. And that lust led to an affair. That affair led to an illegitimate pregnancy. That pregnancy led to David having a man killed. And it, and it haunted him for the rest of his life. Another instance is that we find in the book of Genesis, chapter number three. And again, a story that you know that that you know well. But God created man perfect. He gave one rule. You ever stop to think about that? Adam and Eve had one rule, just one, and they couldn't they couldn't avoid it. I've wondered before. If the first sin wasn't greed. Because again, they had everything but this one thing. But when we look at verse number 6 of uh, Genesis chapter 3. The serpent is talking to Eve. And he's told her already. And we'll back up to verse 5. This is Satan speaking. It says, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. In verse 6. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. So you see, that there's multiple problems there. She's, she's allowing God's word to be questioned. Not only does she allow God's word to be questioned, she begins to entertain it. And then she begins to let her eyes look at the fruit, the thing that she knows that she is not supposed to have. And when she sees it, she, she sees it, she says, well, it can't be that bad. It looks like it would be delicious. It looks like it would be good for food. And, so, and it's supposed to make me wise? All because she let her eyes go the long, wrong way and she sinned, she gave to her husband, and he sinned, and then destined all mankind for hell without a Savior in that one movement. And now there's a point there that can be made that your sin doesn't just affect you. There's been many people that this whatever sin you want to name only affects me. You couldn't be more wrong. You're just as wrong as the guy who said that words will never hurt me. Because... Your sin affects everyone around you. If you have a family, if you're married, your sin affects your family. Because if, whenever one person falls out, it affects everyone else. Another instance of the Bible we see is when Abraham, uh, Abram and Lot, they can no longer be together. Their herds have gotten too big. And so they decide to go their separate ways. And Abraham lets Lot choose where he's going. What does Lot do? He looks towards Sodom. And he sees that the plains look great. And then he pitches his tent towards Sodom. So he lets his eyes dwell on the filth that was going on in Sodom. And, rem and re let me remind you how wicked of a town this is. God told Abraham that he would save it if there were ten righteous people there. And by then Lot was there. And there were not ten righteous people to be found in Sodom. So Lot allowed his eyes to be looking at that, to see it. And I know my parents, when I was growing up, they were very honest and, and told us that there is pleasure in sin for a season. It looks good. It looks fun. I've, I've often heard my dad uh, talk about the alcohol commercials on TV and how it's always young, good-looking people having a great time. They never show the alcoholic. They never show the broken home that re results from it. They never show what actually happens 10 years down the road whenever, whenever there's an addiction there and all the issues that go along with that. 
Because sin looks good, at least for a season. It's fun for at least a season. And, but the problem is, that season's going to end. And when it's over, what are you going to be left with? <clears throat> uh, uh, the next passage of Scripture I want to turn to is the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. <clears throat> In the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, uh, we'll read verses 1 and 2. It says, let me take a drink of water. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, <clears throat> and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we find in verse number two there, where our eyes should be, looking unto Jesus. Because there's a lot of things in this world that seem great. You know, it's fun to sit around and think, if I won the lottery, hopefully you're not playing the lottery, but it's fun to sit around and think, if I won the lottery, this is what I'd do with the money. Now, again, hopefully you're not playing the lottery. I've never play, played the lottery, but it is fun to entertain those thoughts. But you've got to be careful when you do that. Because, again, that's allowing something that shouldn't be in our lives to start to seep in, uh, seep in little by little. Yeah. And it's getting our eyes off the prize. It's getting our eyes off of Jesus because we begin to be consumed with us and everything going on in our lives. We'll go back to uh, Proverbs chapter number 4 in verses 26 and 27. And we're, we're, we're wrapping up. Verse 26 says, Ponder the, uh, the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. You know, that last phrase there, remove thy foot from evil. You see, I, I, I remember times, and thankfully I didn't fall into sin like some of those around me, and I'm not, I hope I don't, that doesn't come across as pharisaical. I, I really hope it doesn't. But I remember there were been some times where I've been in places where I shouldn't have been. And I allowed myself to linger there. And, the, and no, it didn't necessarily get me, but I've seen other young preachers that allowed their self, themselves to be in the same situation. And they, and they didn't, didn't escape. But the problem is, they see it, and like with Lot and Sodom, he saw how great things were, and he kept getting closer and kept getting closer until he was in the city, and judgment came. And, you, and, we, and we see the corruption that had hit his own family because he didn't remove his foot from evil. Whenever the angels tell a lot of what's going to happen, he runs into and tells his family, God's judgment's coming, we got to get out of here. And his sons-in-laws mocked him like he was a maniac. Why, we've never seen this side of you before. You're crazy. And he lost most of his family because of it. As a matter of fact, we'll avoid all the other just wicked things that he offered to be done. But whenever it was time to go, he still didn't want to leave. The angels had to remove him. For Abraham's sake, the angels picked, uh, got him, his wife, and his two daughters who were unmarried, got them out of the city. And of course, Mrs. Lot didn't make it. She looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. He went to evil and then he didn't remove himself from it. I understand that I'm talking to a bunch of imperfect people tonight. And you may be saying, not me, I am perfect. Well, I'll see you on the altar here shortly. Uh, but there will be times, if we're not careful, that we do allow ourselves to be in the wrong place. Because we're sinners. And we're going to mess up. Where the problem is, is when we find ourselves in evil, first of all, we shouldn't be running to it, but the next thing is, when we find ourselves there, get out. You know, the, when you find yourself in a hole, what's the first rule? Stop digging. Yep. <laughs> yeah, before, before anything else, stop digging. Psalm, uh, the, uh, Psalm 85 and verse 13 says, Righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. 
That's talking about the uh, talking about a righteous man. But when a, but when a man who's trying to follow God, he's trying to get get going in the right direction. He's got his eyes in the right place. His foot's not in evil. God is setting his is, is directing exactly where he should go. Amen. And that's where I want to be found. I don't remember where I heard this, this quote, so I'm not going to act like it's uh, original. But I remember a preacher sharing this one time, and while it's not perfect, I think there are a lot of good things in it. I've not always been who I'm supposed to be, but I've always been where I'm supposed to be. Can I tell you, as a child of God, you know you should be in God's house. Amen. You know that you should be around other Christians. You know that you should be in the Bible. Now, when you're backslidden, you don't want to be in the Bible. I, I understand that. That means you need to get your heart right. But the problem is, so oftentimes, whenever we start to fall away, and I don't know how many times I've seen it in my life, where you would see someone, and you can, and you can see the progression where someone's faithful, they're as involved in church as anyone else, they're there every time the door is open, then all of a sudden they start missing the occasional Wednesday. Then, you know, it's not long before they start missing the occasional Sunday night. And they're not coming at all on Wednesdays. Then before long, they're Sunday morning only. Then they start missing Sunday morning. And next thing you know, they're out of church. Mm-hmm. And then in their family, something horrific happens. Their kids turn away or whatever. And they want to look around and say, where did I go wrong? I can tell you where you went wrong. You weren't where you were supposed to be, even when your mind wasn't where it was supposed to be. I'm, and I know that can may come across as a little pharisaical. Like I said, I've got issues with that statement. I really do. But being in the right place will fix a lot of problems. A lot of problems. And, and, but the next thing to work on is, is the heart issue. And I'll say this <clears throat> as, we, as we conclude the message. We've already read Matthew 12, 34, which is Christ speaking. It says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So whenever we find ourselves and the things we're talking about aren't necessarily bad, but they're not godly either, you might want to check your heart. Yeah. I, heard, uh, I heard a pastor say that we talk about the things that we love. And I'm afraid that's so often why we fail to speak about Jesus. Mm. Even when I was in Bible college, you wanted to be the weird guy at the lunch table? Bring up the Bible. I know that doesn't sound right. You're in Bible college, but when I was there, that's how that could happen. And it's because so oftentimes our heart isn't where it's supposed to be. We're not allowing God to the influence that he should have. <clears throat> we'll read one last uh, verse of scripture. Book of Psalm 139. Now, I know this is a song, but don't worry, I'm not going to sing it for you tonight. <laughs> I don't know that uh, my voice would hold up. The, song, the 139th Psalm, the last two verses are of it. Verse 23 and 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and, we, and lead me in the way everlasting. Yeah. So uh, I, I want to leave you with, with that. In that request, if you want your heart to be right, don't hold it up to me. Don't compare yourself to me. First of all, you might make me look bad. But don't compare it to any other man. Because men at best are still men at best. But when we want our heart cleaned out, the person that we should go to is God. And that's exactly what the psalmist is saying. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Now, God already knows your heart. But when you're inviting him in and, you, and, and he follows that up with saying, try me and know my thoughts. That's a scary place. You know, I, uh, people have asked before, if you could have a superpower, what could it be? I have never wanted to know people's thoughts. What they say is bad enough. The last thing I want to know is what they really think about me. Uh, but uh, but uh, David, I believe it's David. Yes, David is saying, and know my thoughts. And in verse 24, and if there be any wicked way in me, Anything that you don't like, whatever it is, Lord, whatever is getting in the way of my relationship with you, get rid of it. Yes. And lead me in your way. Lead me in the way everlasting. I want to ask you tonight, when was the last time you 
had that kind of prayer to God. Mm-hmm. The last time you held up a mirror and said, or the last time you went for a heart checkup, and I don't mean to the cardiologist, but the last time you went to God for a heart checkup and said, Lord, my heart's not where it should be. Help me. Get rid of the junk in my life. Help me to follow you more closely. I know I've got some work there, but when was the last time we made that prayer? Let's pray. Lord, we love you. And Lord, I thank you for your word.